If you want to build a subwoofer box, you're going to need some tools. Let's talk about it. I am very fortunate. I have got a garage full of amazing tools, but it didn't start that way. It started really small. I started with a cheap saw and some makeshift saw horses over a decade ago. If you're just getting started, I'm going to show you what tools to buy first. We're going to step through the tools from level one all the way up to pro level tools that everyone dreams of having one day. The first thing you do when you build a box is cut. You have to be able to cut straight lines and cut circles. And the most straightforward and affordable way to cut those straight lines is with a circular saw. Corded or cordless, it doesn't matter. Get whatever you can afford. This is the kind of thing you can pick up at a pawn shop. This one was my father-in-law's and I just keep it around in memory of him. But if you can afford the cordless, go ahead and get the cordless because you'll probably want to upgrade the cordless eventually anyway. You will need to cut out a speaker hole. The jigsaw is the basic entry level tool for that. It will take some time and practice to make perfect circles or even usable circles with a jigsaw. Corded or cordless, again, if you can't afford the cordless, buy the corded, pick it up in a pawn shop, don't spend a lot of money on it because you'll want to upgrade to a cordless model at some point. If you're first getting started, you will probably use the good old glue and screw method for holding the box together. You drill a pilot hole with a drill and then you drive in a screw. It's the most simple, straightforward way to build boxes and it works. Obviously you'll go cordless with these. This will probably be your first cordless tool. What you want to do is look for a set with a drill and a driver. That's going to be your biggest bang for the buck. As for the brand, buy what you can afford. There's going to be some tool snobs that are going to tell you that their favorite brand of tool is the best brand of tool. Remember, every dollar you spend on tools is a dollar you can't spend on the subwoofer and you're building a subwoofer box. You're not in it for the tools, you're in it for the base. You're going to need drill bits. Drills aren't useful without drill bits. An inexpensive basic twist bit set will get you started. This one's not inexpensive and basic. I wore my basic ones out and bought nice ones. You'll need, of course, driver bits as well. A basic set is really all you need. You don't have to spend a lot of money on these. And this right here is the ultimate hack for beginners. Mine's really dusty. I haven't used it in a while, but this is is the Craig rip cut. This is an edge guide that you put on your circular saw. And yes, you can just use a straight edge to get straight cuts, but there's something about this that makes it worth the money. And that's this gauge right here. If you want a 20 inch cut, you set it for a 20 inch cut, and then you can make repeated 20 inch cuts without resetting your edge guide. And if you're new, you by definition are unskilled, and you will make a mistake setting up your edge guide. You might find yourself too wide by a 16th of an inch on the first cut and then too narrow by a 16th on the next cut. And then you're an eighth of an inch off and that can be a pretty sizable error. With this, if you're a 16th of an inch off, you'll be the exact same 16th of an inch off in every dimension and your box will still go together. The other thing you need to go with the rip cut is a piece of foam insulation. You just lay the foam down and then lay a whole sheet of plywood on top of it and then grab the rip cut and start ripping. Clamps are important. You don't have to have clamps, but they will make your life easier. I use clamps as extra hands. Buy them as you can afford them. Wait for them to go on sale. When I first started doing this, a woodworking friend said, only get 36 inch long clamps because you can always make the clamps shorter. But what I've learned is always having 36 inch long clamps means well in small projects, you've got a bunch of big clamps in the way and you'll only need the big clamps on your really big projects. So shorter ones, in my opinion, do just as fine and they're a little bit cheaper. Wood glue might be the most important part. It's literally the glue that holds things together. If you have straight cuts, wood glue is all you need to seal the seams and hold everything together. You will need to wire up the subwoofer. So you'll need to do some basic wiring, which means you'll need some basic wire tools Something like this is a standard entry level cheap set of strippers, cutters, crimpers. They're terrible, but they get the job done. I, these just sit in a toolbox and I never touch them. I've literally had these for years. I'm pretty sure I stole these from my dad. You will want to upgrade to better ones at some point. You'll need to do something to make the box look nice. Basically, I recommend a product called Duratex, which is a roll on textured finish. It's really easy to use. It's pretty much idiot proof. It's not cheap, but it's really good. If you want to use carpet, you'll need a can of spray adhesive and you'll need some good sharp knives. I'm a big fan of knives like this because this is one of those breakaway knives. So when the tip gets dull, you just snap it off off you go. This is a speed square. You don't have to have one of these, but it will make your life easier and you'll use it all the time. What I like to do is put my pencil right on the slots at three quarters of an inch over and mark a line. So I know where the edge of the wood is. So I don't drive screws into 
nothing. And just so I'm clear, in this video, I'm just talking about tools you need to build a subwoofer box. I'm not talking about the tools you need to actually install it in the car. If you wanna build home audio speakers, it's the same set of tools. So why not build your own home theater subwoofer? That's actually how I got started. That was the first thing I ever built. It was fun and I was hooked. Now that was level one. We're gonna rewind and go back to level zero. You're gonna need some PPE. We typically use MDF to build speakers and MDF is terrible stuff. You'll want some dust masks. You'll want some hearing protection. Things right here can be stupid loud. And so you want to invest in some cheap earplugs of nothing else. Because I wear glasses, I usually put on goggles and I found them to be uncomfortable. They get dusty, they fog up and they're terrible. So I actually ended up spending some extra money on some prescription shatterproof lenses. Moving on to level two. Level two is where the fun starts because you're gonna get one of these right here. You're gonna get a plunge router and you're gonna buy one of these circle jigs and then you're gonna spend a little extra money to get a good quarter inch spiral bit. You won't need this right here to cut your circles anymore. You're basically cutting circles like a pro when you upgrade to this. This is the game changer right here. When you pick up the router, go ahead and get yourself some of these router bits right here. You'll want to buy a kit like this. I'll give you a link to one down in the video description. You want something with a roundover bit, a chamfer bit, and a rabbit bit. The rest are all kind of more general woodworking tools that you might use, you might not, who knows but it's the cheapest way to get the basic bits that you're gonna to need to build speakers, to put things like roundovers on the edge of the speakers or roundovers on your ports. When you're on the internet looking these things up, you'll find people on Facebook and on forums saying not to buy these kind of kits because the bits aren't any good, they'll wear out and you'll be upgrading later. That's the buy once, cry once attitude. Buy once, cry once is an excuse to buy more expensive stuff and I don't care what you're doing, there's always a more expensive version of what you're looking at. If you follow the buy once, Cry once mentality, you end up doing one of two things. You'll either rack up a whole bunch of credit card debt because you think you have to have the best tools to get started, or you'll never buy the tools and never get started. To me, buy once, cry once is gatekeeping behavior. It's okay to buy what you can afford. Also in level two, you wanna to upgrade to a brad nailer. You've got two options. You can go the cordless route with a battery or you can get you an air compressor and go pneumatic. The pneumatic's gonna be cheaper, but you gotta buy a compressor. The good news is the cheapest air compressor with a tiny half gallon tank from Walmart will get the job done. That's how I started. It'll drive Brad Nails no problem. But I got tired of dragging the air hose around the shop, stumbling over it, making a safety hazard. So I moved to all cordless tools. And I specifically went with this Ryobi line right here because it was the only tool brand that had a reasonably priced cordless brad nailer. My advice when picking a brand of cordless tool, a battery platform, is to choose a battery platform that has the tools you know you'll need when you're ready to upgrade. Level two is when you want to build yourself a workbench. Build something that fits the way you like to work. The first one I ever built had a gap in the middle specifically so I could use that rib cut on the workbench. This one right here, I built it several years ago. When I built it, I made it the exact same height as my table saw at the time and I built it so I had adequate clearance to put a shop vac and a cyclone underneath it so it was my dust collection table and my outfeed table and my assembly table in level two that's where you want to buy yourself a sander it doesn't matter if it's corded or cordless if you don't have one already level two is where you're going to buy your shop vac the brand is irrelevant they're all shop vacs my recommendation is to go ahead and buy a bag and a HEPA filter. You need the HEPA filter to keep the fine dust out of your lungs. You need the bag to keep the heavy dust out of the HEPA filter. A regular filter and no bag is better than nothing. No shame in starting there. But this isn't level one, this is level two. So spend the extra money. Also in level two, you wanna buy soldering iron and soldering iron accessories. You'll need solder. Make sure you don't get the stuff that's used for pipes. You need solder for electronics. This is a really old soldering iron. It says Radio Shack. That's how old it is. It's, wow, when's the last time you saw a Radio Shack? Some people like to use the wet sponge to clean off their tips. I prefer this, I get better results. If you can afford a soldering station like this, it's a good one. Wouldn't hesitate to recommend. I like to try to get away from cords whenever I can. So I've been gradually moving things over to the cordless M12 tools because they have this soldering iron. You can also get the torch based soldering irons that work really well. I use one of those for several years and it's nice not to be tied to a plug. A heat gun for shrinking your shrink wrap is handy. Any heat gun will get the job done. I've tried cordless before. It was a cheap one from Harbor Freight and I did not like it. I've not tried a name brand cordless one yet but everyone I know personally who has tried them don't like them. This right here is called Helping Hands. It's basically has these clamps that you use to hold down your projects when soldering. There's some people selling 
3D printed ones as well that work great. These make your life easier and they're not terribly expensive. So if we're in level two, at that point you've built a lot of boxes so you can really justify upgrading your tool. This is a stage where you wanna upgrade your wire strippers and wire cutters. If you can afford nicer name brands, go for it. It's your money, spend it on what you like. Also, while you're upgrading, you wanna upgrade your marker tools. I love these right here. These are woodpecker knockoffs that you can get on Amazon and they're, they're great marking tools. I'll be sure to give you a link to these down in the video description. This one right here is one of my favorite. It's a 3D square, so there you go. Isn't that cool? And if you find that you need more clamps, now's a good time to go ahead and spend more money on clamps. As we move on to level three, here's where things really start to change. Everything we've gone over so far could fit inside of a garage and still have room for cars. When you move into level three, you're really gonna need some more space. When I got to this level, I put everything on rollers and I would roll everything out into the driveway to work mostly so I could keep the sawdust down in the garage, but also so I could have room. We still needed to park a car in the garage. That's what a garage is for, for cars. Level three is where you wanna get either a starter table saw or a good track saw. They're gonna run you about the same amount of money. If you go the table saw route, I'm gonna recommend that you spend a little bit more money and you get a saw stop. The table saw is the most dangerous tool in your workshop. Now the saw stop doesn't fix the biggest problem with table saws and that's kickback. But what often happens in a kickback situation is you'll be holding on to your material and as the kickback happens, it'll draw your hand across the blade and cut off your fingers. Now you're still gonna get punched in the gut by the wood when it kicks back, but at least you'll have your fingers. Kickback scares the hell out of me for another reason. I'm six foot three. If there's a kickback, it's not punching me in the gut. Ouch. If you go with a track saw, you'll be able to save some money at a later stage. I'll tell you more about that when we get there. Also at this stage, you wanna buy a router table. Maybe you're ready to spend the money and get a dedicated router lift and build your own router table or maybe you just wanna buy one of these more inexpensive entry-level tables, but this is where you're gonna up your router game. When I was ready for this stage, I bought the Bosch router and the table that went with it because it was just easier to put the Bosch router in the Bosch router table, so stick to the same brand. I used that router table until I, and I used that router table until I outgrew it. As a way to kind of bridge the gap, I built that router table into a custom workbench. That gave me a second assembly table and a place for the router and it worked out well for a while. With a router table and a table saw, the two things that make the dust are now stationary, and that's a good time to go ahead and upgrade to a small dust cyclone. Most people build a little cart to put theirs on. I already told you earlier about this workbench back here that was designed specifically with that in mind. Also in level three, now that you're serious about building boxes, you need to be serious about making sure your boxes don't suck. And the best way to do that is to test them. You want this thing right here. This is called a DATS. That stands for Dayton Audio Test System. This is what you're gonna use to verify you hit your intended tuning frequency for your ported boxes. If you're serious about building speakers, you have to have one of these. So make room in your budget. And for those of you who aren't gonna build your own speakers and you're paying a shop, why don't you ask them if they have a DATS? How does the shop know that the box is any good if they haven't tested it with something like this? While we're talking test gear, you're at the stage now where you need a digital multimeter. This one also doubles as an oscilloscope. It's a great tool. I've been using it for years. They don't make this exact brand anymore, but I'll give you a link to one that works great. At this stage, you're also gonna wanna upgrade your router bits as you can afford to buy new bits and buy better bits. Router bits help you solve problems and router bits increase the quality of your work by adding details that you couldn't make in stage one. So spend a little money on these at this point. If you bought a table saw as part of stage three, you're gonna want some roller stands for in-feed and out-feed. This allows you to handle larger pieces of material safely. These are from Harbor Freight and they're flimsy junk. Don't buy these. So that is level three. And if you're in level three, you're in a really good spot. You can do a whole lot with those level three tools. But if you wanna do more, let's check out level four. Level four is where you're gonna upgrade your table saw. This is a saw stop and it is filthy. I just finished a project and haven't had time to clean. When I first got it, this cast iron surface was shiny and pretty and it was really cool. And I spent the extra money to get the extra long fence so it can make 36 inch rips, which is really cool. I like the saw stop. I've used it a whole lot. Don't regret buying it, but hindsight's 2020. If I could go back in time, knowing what I know now, I would have just built a really big four foot by eight foot work table 
and then bought a really nice track saw. And that's because I splurged and I bought this big monster over here, my CNC machine. And this now does 75, 80, maybe 90% of my cutting. But that really is a level five machine. More on that in a second. We're still in level four. Level four is where you want to upgrade your dust collection. Over here, I've got a dust cyclone with a catch can. And then right here, I've got a Harbor Freight dust collector with a HEPA filter. The other cool thing about the upgraded saw and the dust collection system is it's pretty quiet given what it is. This table saw is quieter than the saw that I used to have, my portable saw and the dust collection is quite a bit quieter than the shop vac. That's one of the benefits of the better tools. I can work out here in the garage with the door closed, the dust collection on, and the saw on, and I'm not worried about bothering my neighbors. Back here behind me is the router table, and this is a router table that I built myself with a router lift in it from Jessam. So in this stage, this is where you want to, if you haven't already, to go ahead and build yourself a nice router table. This one right here is designed with storage underneath. It's messy, of course, because I'm not well organized. It's got some drawers here for storage where I can keep router bits and that kind of thing. It does double duty as my miter saw stand as well. More about the miter saw in just a little bit. This is the stage where if you think you need it, you can get yourself a drill press and a hydraulic press the main constraint on those is gonna be space because you're filling up your space pretty quick at this point. I don't have either one of those things and the lack of space is why I don't have them. And since you've got a nice big router table in this stage, this is the stage where you might be interested in some of these router templates. We'll talk more about these in just a bit. Now it's time for level five. Level five is what I call the heavy equipment stage. And this is where the things that you buy individually get to be kind of expensive. You probably spent more money in the other stages, but you bought a whole lot of relatively inexpensive things. And the CNC machine is the level five tool. I had no intention of going into level five until I bought a few of these templates. And what I realized is if I went and bought a bunch of these things and all the router bits you've got to buy to make them work, that I'm going to spend just as much money as I would spend on a basic entry-level CNC machine. There's nothing wrong with these templates. They work just fine, but for me, they just weren't cost efficient or labor efficient. The other two things that fall into this category, two things I haven't bought are a CO2 laser and a 3D printer. Now the CO2 laser is really handy because it can cut and etch in clear acrylic which my diode lasers can't do. However, the CNC machine can cut and etch clear acrylic. So while I'd like to have a CO2 laser, I can't justify the expense. As far as the 3D printer goes, I'd like to have one, but I don't yet have a project where I need to use a 3D printer to build the project. That's one of the most important things about buying tools. Only buy the tool if you already know what you're going to make with that tool. It's really kind of a waste of money to buy a tool that's just cool and you think you might use it, but then not have a project in mind for it. So don't buy any of these tools at any level unless you have a specific thing you wanna make and you need that tool to make the thing. The mistake we make is we get it out of order. We buy the tool and then we ask, now that I have it, what can I make? You wanna go the other way where there's a thing you want to make, but you can't make it without that next tool. All right, that was stage five. Now I'm gonna talk about things you should not buy. And here's the first thing you should not buy. You've already seen it. I had a smaller one that did the job, but I I wanted this one because it had a couple of features that I liked. It wasn't until after I bought it that I realized that it was missing a key feature. Most saws at this price point have a laser sight. This one doesn't. I regret buying it. Pretty much everything I can do with this, I can also do on the table saw. If you think you need one, buy a small cheap one. Don't spend a lot of money on this. Another thing on my do not buy list is this right here. This is a laser. Specifically, it is a diode laser. A diode laser can't cut clear acrylic. My car audio guys like their clear acrylic windows so they can look at their subwoofers. I'm telling you not to buy it, but I want to also clarify there's nothing wrong with it. It works great. It does what it's designed to do very well. I've made several projects with it. They sent it out to me and I'm not supposed to tell you not to buy it because they sent it to me. But I have to be honest, save your money and get a CO2 laser. It will do more of what the people who watch my videos tend to want done. But having said that, you can still make some cool stuff with a laser like in this video right up here. I'm Justin. This is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel and I will see you on the next adventure.